Hi folks and welcome back to Conveyancing. This is the video series for the final substantive topic in this unit which is remedies. And if we jump into the Prezi you will see there are a few issues we need to get across in this video series. Firstly we'll have a little look at the remedies available and the issue of election. Uh, we will have a look at termination and damages, specific performance um, and particularly the issues around deposit, not too many issues that can be fairly briefly covered, um, and the uh, issue of misrepresentation. Now all of these topics, perhaps except for deposit, will have been substantively covered in your contract law unit. So all of this stuff should be revision for you pretty much. So a pretty cruisy way to end the unit. Um, looking first at the remedies available and a bit of an overview of what we'll do today. The type of remedy that your client will seek will depend really on the wrong that was done to it or him or her. Uh, if there's been a breach of the agreement, then if the, the breach has been substantial, your client may well wish to terminate and or seek damages. If the breach was only minor, then your client's pretty much going to be relegated to the damages bin, unfortunately. Uh, there may also be uh, the happy days of your client being able to seek contractual remedies as well as those at common law. And uh, there are a number of different remedies in the REIQ standard form contract, including in clause nine. Uh, if misrepresentation is the naughtiness of which your client has suffered uh, or misleading or deceptive conduct under the uh, Australian Consumer Law, then um, you have a suite of potential remedies that might be open to your client. Uh, remembering that generally speaking you would try and go down the track of the ACL because it's much more friendly uh, rather than the mm, comparatively more murky route of misrepresentation at common law. If you're going to seek a remedy for misrepresentation then you are going to be looking at possibly rescission in equity uh, or there are the uh, remedies in section 237 that uh, gets hooked up with section 243 of the ACL. Uh, you may also be looking at damages or you know, if they're not in tort they'll be under section 236 of the ACL. Um, and if the contract has been brought to an end and the buyer is the innocent party, uh, of course they're going to want to get their deposit back and recover any instalments. Uh, if there are remedies that are inconsistent, for example, uh, the ability to affirm the contract, proceed and uh, potentially just claim some compensation or uh, to actually go ahead and terminate the contract, then you're going to have to look at the issue of election and that is what we are going to be looking at in the next slide. Now the first thing to say about election is that this is a final decision. Uh, you can't waver around and elect to terminate, <laughs> waver, mm, bad contract law joke. Uh, you can't purport to terminate and then go, whoops, uh, actually no, I want to affirm and continue on with the contract. It doesn't work like that. Once you've actually elected to terminate, that's it. There's no going back on that baby. So you need to do it carefully and you need to do it correctly and that is what all of your legal knowledge will help you do. Uh, you have to make your election clear and unequivocal. This is why I've got the picture of the loud hailer. Some examples, issuing a writ, claiming termination, that would probably do it. Um, selling the property to someone else, that would definitely do it. Uh, calling for transfer documents that would signal affirmation, would it not? Uh, remember from our discussions around time um, and variations that granting an extension of time within which to settle is not an election either to affirm or to terminate. So just follow that little one in the back of your mind there. Um, it also 
requires that your client or you have the requisite level of knowledge. Now there has been some dispute and this dispute has lingered on for many, many years now uh, about exactly what you, you or your client needs to know before your conduct can be assessed as to whether it's going to be an election to affirm or terminate. Do you need to know of just simply the fact that a breach has occurred? And then anything that you do or say after that can be assessed for whether an election has occurred? Or do you need to know that a breach has occurred and also that you, your, you or your client uh, has the legal right to terminate uh, or rescind the, the contract? Obviously, uh, if your, your client needs to know both of these things before their conduct is fair game, for assessment as to whether an election has occurred, then it's going to be much, much less likely for uh, the conduct to be taken into account as an election uh, if you have to know about your legal rights to terminate before you can make the, the actual election to terminate. Um, unfortunately, the bar has been set lower than having both of those types of knowledge and after Sergeant and ASL, the High Court has indicated that we don't really need to know about our legal rights. If you know about the breach and act in a way that's inconsistent with continuing the contract, it may not change the clear election. Uh, the, the issue hasn't properly been put to bed yet, as I said, but that's the closest indication we've got. In any event, you know, it's going to be very, very um, prudent of you, certainly if you don't want to be caught making some kind of election for your client, to be very mindful of how you conduct yourself and how your client conducts themselves after a breach has occurred. Uh, and then finally, we need to think about when do you need to elect to either affirm or terminate. Uh, well, the time rolls around when the, the, your client or yourself knows that there is a choice between two inconsistent courses of action. Once that, and that would normally be you know, triggered by a breach, uh, it has to be done within a reasonable time. There's that good old reasonable time, objective test. Uh, if a statute says uh, the time for exiting the, exercising the right to terminate is at settlement, uh, then your client won't be able to actually waive their right to terminate until that time. So they, they're in a bit safer position. Uh, so in the MP management and Chervin case, uh, the client actually had confirmed the contract had gone unconditional and they were still held not to have waived their right to terminate or to have elected to affirm, in other words, uh, because the statute gave them until settlement to actually choose what they wanted to do. Uh, so particularly where the aim of the statute is consumer protection, you'll find a court is fairly strict about protecting uh, the, the consumer's rights there and they won't uh, let them lose the ability to terminate or make the choice to terminate uh, until the time stipulated in the legislation. And the last bullet point there is the issue I was alluding to earlier, which is a party will be held to their solicitor's conduct. So uh, as I said, word to the wise, be very, very mindful about how you conduct yourself. Once you know that there's a breach uh, that has occurred on the other party's side, that may well allow your client to elect uh, to either terminate or affirm because anything you say or do will be likely held against you. Uh, so that is the issue of election. And now we can look at the first substantive topic here, which is termination. The thing that you want to do with termination straight off the bat is uh, keep that very separate in your mind from the concept of rescission. And I do bang on about this uh, consistently in the contract law unit. But you really, the clearer this is for you, the uh, easier it will be to work out uh, which rights and remedies that your client will seek to rely on when a breach has occurred. Um, termination cuts off the contract where it lies. So from the point of termination, everything 
forward in time from then is actually cancelled. Okay, everything up until the point of termination stays on foot. Super important to remember that bit because any payments that have become due before that point of termination, they will still have to be paid. Any rights that have unconditionally vested before that point, again, they won't fly away out into the ether, they will stay on foot. Okay, rescission on the other hand is I liken it to unwinding or unpicking, unraveling a contract back to the very starting point. That's why it's called rescission ab initio. Okay, uh, so therefore payments that have been made have to be uh, handed back over. Uh, all of the doings of the contract, the performance that uh, the parties have done has to be unwound to substantially return the parties to that status quo ante, the beginning point. Uh, and if the court has to make orders for restitution, substantial restitution, uh, giving the money back, taking property back, uh, those kinds of things, to get the parties back to that initial position, that is what will happen all as part and parcel of an action for rescission. So please keep those two concepts very, very clear in your mind because they have very different consequences for your client in the circumstances of breach. Uh, now, if you're looking at common law termination, you will recall from your contract days, there are various triggers that will set off the right to terminate at common law. First and foremost is breach of an essential term and you will hopefully recall the tramways advertising case from the contract and the test there as to whether or not a term is an essential condition is whether the uh, party would have entered the contract without some kind of assurance of a strict or at least substantial performance of that term. Okay, if the party just wouldn't have entered into the contract without the term, it's a fair bet it would be a condition and therefore essential breach of which will allow your client to terminate. The Gilson and Flamingo Enterprises case uh, centred around a condition of uh, unobstructed views. Um, the second thing that may trigger off uh, your client's right to terminate at common law will be a serious breach of an intermediate term. In the olden days we used to call these in nominate terms uh, and the Hong Kong Fur Shipping Company should hopefully sound somewhat familiar to you um, and in that case if you have an intermediate term it means mm, it might act as a condition, it might act as a mere warranty for which you cannot terminate and just get damages. Uh, what you have to do is wait until you see the effect of the breach if the innocent party has been deprived of substantially the whole benefit of the contract then it's uh, Fair to say that the breach will be considered a breach of an essential term and the right to terminate will arise. Uh, the final trigger where um, termination rights may arise is where the other party has repudiated their obligations under the contract. The big case here is Chevel and the Builders Licensing Board and there are a number of different kinds of repudiation uh, the repudiation might be express, as in, I don't want, want to perform this contract anymore, I'm out. Uh, it might be implied from conduct. Remember, if it is implied, uh, it has to be clear that the other party that is doing the repudiation is wholly and finally disabled from actually going ahead and performing. Uh, it might be via a party's clinging to their erroneous interpretation of the contract and how it should be performed. Uh, it might be the other party's wrongful termination and this is the real exclamation point I think here in this discussion. Uh, it may well be that if you terminate incorrectly the other party can take that as a repudiation of the contract and therefore uh, accept your repudiation or your client's repudiation and claim damages that way. So there's, it's a fairly high stakes game here is termination. You do it wrong and the other party might claim that you have uh, repudiated the contract uh, yourself or themselves. Um, in terms of uh, 
a substantial defect in title or material misdescription that will give the right to terminate. However, remember that right has to be exercised before settlement, otherwise a uh, good old merger will say goodbye to that right there. After termination, the buyer can of course seek damages for loss of the bargain under section 68 of the Property Law Act. Now, there are a number of clauses in the standard REIQ houses and land contract that will allow your client to terminate if they have been breached. Uh, and you will recall many of these um, because we've covered most of them already in this unit. Clauses three and four, that's your subject to finance clause and also the building and pest. Uh, 7.4 is the seller's warranties. 7.5 is survey and mistake. 7.6 requirements of authorities, remember the outstanding notices requiring works to be done. 7.7 uh, .7 is the property adversely affected uh, clause and clause 9 is uh, the breach of essential term or fundamental breach of intermediate term clause there. Uh, you need to bear all of those in mind, um, very important clauses that will provide your client with a way out should they need it. Um, now, in terms of limits on the ability to terminate, uh, many of these will have been covered off in your contract law unit, uh, but the one that I will flag there for you is instalment contracts. Now, we did look at instalment contracts uh, earlier on in this unit, and uh, under section 72 sub 1 of the Property Law Act, you will re remember that uh, before you can go ahead and terminate an instalment contract, you have to provide notice and 30 days within which the party in breach can fix up their breach. If they do fix it up, then you can, cannot terminate. Uh, if they don't fix it up, then only then uh, can you go ahead and terminate. Uh, the others you will be familiar with, affirmation, uh, the party that actually wants to terminate has to be ready, willing and able themselves to uh, perform the contract. They can't be in breach themselves if they want to go ahead and terminate. Uh, you have to comply with any notice requirements stipulated in the contract. If you don't, uh, you have that lovely Commonwealth and uh, uh, AMAN aviation kind of situation that arises where the other party can claim that your failure to comply with the notice requirements has actually meant that your purported wrongful termination of the contract is a repudiation and uh, they can accept that and sue for damages. Uh, you have to comply with all of the stipulated methods of notice that the contract sets out. Uh, you will note that the text discusses these at length uh, and we covered them all in contract law as well so I won't labour the point here. Uh, the last thing that might cut into your client's right to terminate will be equitable doctrines such as uh, relief from forfeiture or estoppel. So that is the issue of termination and having passed the magical 15 minute mark now I think we'll go on to video two. So until then, bye for now guys.